Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> that should be working. No. Yep, okay, we are recording. So um, welcome everybody to Sunday Styles. It's, uh, what are we, the 20th of Feb, 2022. We'll put that on the record for some time in the future when we go back and have a look at all these. And uh, uh, my name's Nigel. I'm from We Love Craft Beer and Beer Education. Uh, we're joined today with uh, by Simon Skidmore, who's also a member here, and he is... Um, studying his BJCP and I'm studying my Cicerone and together we're a couple of beer geeks, um, not really qualified to do anything, but qualified to, to ramble and talk about beer. Um, so that's what we'll do. And today we're going to talk about um, the style, which is, um, we, we use the BJCP guidelines 23G, which is a, a goza. Um, so um, I, didn't find those. I read three of them very quickly. Oh, did you? Yeah. Nice. So um, we, we we use those guidelines, and in the in the document there, we'll also refer to some of the things in there in terms of the colour charts, um, the serving temperatures, the glassware, all that sort of stuff. Um, I'll just do a quick intro, and then I'll hand over to Simon because he's going to deliver on this one. But um, so um, basically, um, well, you t you tell the story of the history, perhaps first, Simon. That's probably the best best place to start. So, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, sometimes it's a bit hard to verify all these things because we're talking about things from a long time ago because this is a historical beer. Um, and it goes way back to Middle Ages, perhaps. Yeah. Is So it's hard to know if, how much of this is true or not. But Goza, perhaps it's named after the river that's in this mining town called Gosla. And they used to mine for iron ore way back to the time of the Romans in Gosla. So everyone's got this, um, all, all the crap from the mine is ending up in this river, all the minerals. And of course, it's the same river that everyone gets their drinking water out. It's the same river they make beer out of. They get the water from that to make the beer at the brewery. And so this town of Gosla had its own unique type of beer. It had this really minerally salty type beer probably more briny than salty. And, of course, then you add in a bit of – they don't have the same sterilising equipment and disinfectants we have today. So you end up with this slightly tart because a bit of lactic acid bacteria gets in there. And you end up with this style that we call Goza. And there's talk in Leipzig. It became really popular. Um, by 1740, they reckon they had 80 Goza houses in this town of Leipzig. So it became a big deal, but then it dived in popularity around the time of World War II. But in recent times, we've had this big resurgence. It's been rediscovered, this goes up. And modern craft brewers are doing them, but they want to always throw fruit at them. So you had a margarita goza, Sean. What did, I do, yeah. I, I've got a blueberry goza. What did, every, did everyone else, what did you guys find? Uh, yeah, I've got the, um, oh, sorry. You're on? I didn't find this. This, this found me. I actually got a subscription from Craft Cartel. <laughs> this just turned up randomly. Oh, I just yeah, had, yeah, I, had really. hand. I got lime zest. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you got, Adrian? Yeah, I got the, um, the beer farm, the, the assign, the assign. Assam Boy. Okay. Which I've seen going around for a little while. Um, I think there's a bit of a, a tea base going with the Assam tea, I think. Yeah, um, right. Don't know much about it, but it might be interesting to see how that goes. Um, it's a plum set. A, it's a plum goza. Oh, I actually right. had that one. I had that one and this one in my hand at the same time and chose the lime one, so I was not far off <laughs> having the same yeah. one. Oh, I got yeah. it. I got Sorry. this one from uh, Sailor's Grave. It's called Down She Goes. Sailor's Grave are uh, in the Gippsland, uh, northeast Victoria, Gippsland, and they're really, uh, really good at brewing some real with botanicals and stuff like this. This has actually got a wheat beer base, 
um, but it doesn't have a fruit added, so that's why I went with this one. I did get the lime zest one as well, the Akasha, so, um, but I've got, there'll be a bit of a stark comparison there, I think. Well, just read the can on this one, it's amongst the regular ingredients. This has got aguare, lime, lemon, sea salt, tequila, contro, I love. Tequila and Quantro. That sounds like get you going. Yeah, it's a little bit out there. I'm just seeing what the ABV is on this thing. Uh, it's, it's one and a half standard drink, so it's probably around the about towards the five percent mark. Right. Yeah. Well, we better make, not make it a dry argument. So everybody pour their gla uh, drinks, and while you're doing that, I'll I'll pour mine. But just a couple of quick tips. So uh, the style is uh, because of the. Um, the sort of sharpness of it should always be drank cold, so probably around four or five degrees. So normal fridge temperature for that's cool. Uh, glassware uh, recommended one is called a Stang, right? Which is actually the same beer uh, glass you use for a Kolsch. It's a it's a tall, narrow, cylindrical glass. About this one's uh, uh, about three hundred mils, but a traditional one's only about two hundred mils. Um, but anything tall. Where do we find one of them? Oh, that was that, I've had that one for a long time. I got it um, in a bottle shop back in Sydney when I. It's a the Stagel um, is the is the brand of the beer, and that's and it was sort of one of those yeah, ones well, where you buy the beer and you get the glass type thing. So yeah, they're pretty hard to come by. But if you haven't got one of those, anything tall and narrow, that's a like a, a, a footed pilsner glass or something like that. Um, Main thing is you don't want uh, with the with the taller glasses like that you keep your fingers at the bottom so you don't get you know don't don't hold it like that because otherwise it's going to warm up too quickly on a day like today it's yeah. 20, 27 yeah, yeah, degrees yeah. keep your fingers well yeah, away yeah, from yeah. it. Oh, you know, I've got to hold the base. Yeah, actually, I do have a tall glass like that. I got one from Crafter as well. It was actually quite a tall thing, but it's uh, not to dig it out. Back to you, Simon. Sure. So the thing is, like, we're talking about Gozer as a style today. Look, I've, I've, I've got a blueberry Gozer. Mm. And this is the thing, like, modern craft beer, want to throw all sorts of different. And it's become a bit of a thing. It's been a base style because sours are really starting to take off now. People appreciate them. People are getting into them. So Gozer, I think, found its niche there. And I've heard it described like someone's always got that creepy old uncle who cracks a Corona and then he gets a wedge of uh, lime and then dips it in salt and puts it in the beer. And it's the same sort of idea we're trying to do with the Gozi. You're trying to bring a little bit more salt to the thing. Um, and that balances this and actually gives it a bit more of a fuller mouthfeel than most sours. So if we take when we taste these, we'll notice there's a bit more... It gives you this idea of a bit more fullness, if you like. It's not something that sort of comes, goes, it doesn't feel thin on the palate. And that's mainly what that, and I think most breweries you'll find use sea salt. So sodium chloride, normal table salt goes into this. And that's the main difference between this and your other sours, which you use. That's what gives it that extra full, and it shouldn't be salty. It shouldn't feel like salty. It should just give this fuller, slightly briny type feel to the palate when you taste them. Interestingly, with this one, because he's a real forager, they actually use um, seaweed to get it get the flavour in this. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> seaweed. That's yeah, commitment. He, yeah, that can get some stuff. They're amazing, the, the guys at Sailor Grave. They go out and forage stuff off the uh, side of the road. And I think I did a beer and I think called the, I think it was my bit Sailor's Grave. It actually had abalone, lemongrass, and anise there. And I thought, I should have, I didn't mind it. I didn't, I wouldn't go out and go out and buy it, but I'm, but I drank it. I was like, oh yeah, it was a little bit better than I expected. But yeah, actually, I found, I could pick up the anise and Lemongrass, the Avalanche is a little bit hard to pick up. Yeah. No, they're a pretty good brewer. Yeah. Yeah, cool. All right, so we've all got beers there. Um, 
Shall we jump in and talk about parents tasting and go through all that? Nigel, are you ready for that? Go for it. All right, cool. So have a look at your beer. If it's a fruited beer, it should reflect the colour of the fruit. Mine looks a bit blueberry because there's blueberries in it. Um, your lime not going to shut, not going to turn out green, hopefully. No, definitely not green. <laughs> it's lemon lime. And Nathan, lemon. is that a bit hazy or is that glass haze? Um, no, it is hazy, definitely. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's definitely haze, not glass haze. Okay. What do yours look like, Adrian? Yeah, I actually used a, I used a teku. Yep. <coughs> um, um, yeah, I wasn't sure what style of glass to use. Um, it's, <coughs> it's quite golden. Yep. Um, I poured it quick and, it, it, yeah, head retention wasn't really there. It dropped off pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it didn't, it didn't hang around. Um, so Mine's very rare, rare, but actually, Nigel's probably the lot, longest I've seen a head hang around on a gozo. I was going to say, like, yeah. um, mine's probably the traditional style colour, like the SRM's, like, two to four, which is, like, that almost pale, like, you know, you, pay, you can see pretty much straight through it, really light, clear, really white, fluffy head and very tight, and it's quite heavily carbonated, this one, which is good because often yeah. they're not, but... I don't know what the what the style guidelines say on that. Is it supposed to be heavily carbonated? Yeah, if the mouth feel um, effervescent. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, high to very high carbonation. It, at the end, it's like a wheat beer. The similar sort of things go into it. So you could have fifty fifty wheat pilsner malts. You have a bit more wheat going into it. It's actually pretty high. So when you put a whole lot of wheat into a beer, you get a hazy beer because there's all that protein in it. And sometimes you get good head retention. If you think of like a wheat beer, you, you, you expect this effervescent beer that's got really good head retention that hangs around. And that's because of the protein in the wheat. It gives you good head retention, gives you this thick white head. The difference with a goza, where it changes, is the whole souring process because it depends how they sour it. If you're really lazy, you can get some lactic acid, pour that in the tank, and that doesn't, that doesn't really affect the head retention at all. Um, that's one way of doing it, but it's not the same. It's a pretty clean sourness. A lot of breweries are doing what they call kettle souring. So what they do is they uh, steep their malt, they do their mash, and then once they've done that, they introduce lactic acid bacteria and it's just like making yogurt at home. If you've ever had yogurt, you get about a litre of milk and you add your little sachet of bacteria to it, leave it in a warm place overnight and it becomes yogurt. And that's the same way a lot of these small craft breweries will make their gozers. The advantage of that doing it that way is it's quick and you get a bit of character in the beer. You don't get just that clean lactic you get from lactic acid, but you get a lot more. It's, I think that what I find... It, I'd describe it like as a bit of a yogurty taste. Um, I've made beers myself where I just add lactic acid and then I've made beers where you actually do it through this kettle sour and you get a lot more character to the beer. But the downside is, and this is what you were saying earlier, you've seen a lot of goes, they don't have a lot of good head retention. The lactic acid eats up all those proteins, all those things that give you head retention, the lactic acid eats it up as it sours. So in the end, you end up often with a goza that doesn't have much head retention. Um, Style-wise, what does it say about head retention? Uh, yeah, it does say it wants good head retention, but that's been my experience is that's quite tricky because that kettle souring process tends to kill it a bit. Um, what else do we want to talk about with appearance? It's hazy. It's and um, yeah, it should be well carbonated. Uh, it's not. It's not as sour as a sour. When brewers are brewing this, they're often commonly looking for a pH, a finishing pH of about three point seven five, whereas most brewers are like to finish their sours about three point five. 
So it's on that. It's not going to be as sour as a lot of sour beers, but it's that sort of slight tartness to it. Actually, if you look in the right, comparison so. for the styles, the most, the closest style it compares to that's common is a, a Berliner Weiss. So it's got that sort mm. of like, you know, that, and this one, which is brewed with wheat. So, I, you know, I've had a few Berliner Weisses. Again, they're the ones that typically they'll put a bit of fruit in it, like a peach or a, something else to give it, take away from some of the, the sort of um, the acidity. But when they're pure, like a Berliner Weiss that doesn't have fruit in it, very much the same. It's just got a clean sort of bitiness to it. And I've actually, we were talking about this last time, I've got a pretty sensitive tongue and so I'm really sensitive to acid. And so with one of the reasons why I'm not a real fan of New England IPAs is the juice, juiciness of it hangs to the side of my tongue and I get like a sting on it. You know, if you have fresh pineapple and you eat too much fresh pineapple and it's, it sort of stings your tongue, I'm actually getting that even with this. So, you know, I'm enjoying the beer, but I get a little bit of sting on the tongue from the acidity. Um, but it's nice because it's clean and it's fresh. Like, and it, I guess one of the things we talk about sometimes with uh, beers also for uh, pairing with something, a beer like this, which is clean and crisp and got a bit of acidity, will cut through really rich food. So if you, there's two ways you can look at doing beer and food matching. One is contrast, where you have a totally contrasting uh, flavour, and the other one is complementing. So, you know, that's like complementing is when you have, uh, say, chocolate pudding and a chocolate stout. And contrast is when you have something like this, where I'm thinking like if you had a really thick, rich um, uh, curry or something like that, and then you had a beer like this, like this would really cut through it. So you'd eat the curry and you go, oh, that's really rich and whatever. And this and it's like almost like a, a palate washer. It comes in and cleans it out. And that's the other thing with the sharpness and the acidity. It really cuts through a lot of stuff. Also with like fish and chips, greasy type stuff, really good to cut through um, those fattiness with some acidity uh, with a beer like this. I had a um, sockade raspberry Berliner post last night. And yeah, it was actually quite acidic, but I enjoyed it because it's actually, I, I love raspberry. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and that, as I said, I thought it sort of really ramped it up a bit and actually gave it a bit of character. Whereas, uh, yeah, you get some, uh, like, it was a bit like the way I've had the way with yeah. you know, was as well. I actually quite like that one as well. Yeah. Uh, for the fact that the raspberry and that, those beers really sort of resonate with me. Whereas, you know, yeah, you get some sours, I think, or the sour name, but that don't really do much. Like, this thing I'm drinking now, like, it's a goes so it's not overly sour. Yeah. If anything, it's got that. If you ever remember what sweat slime cordials are like, or big slime cordials, a bit like that, but without being syrupy. Yeah, yeah, thankfully. that's a good description, actually. Yeah, that lime yeah. cordial. Yeah. Um, so you can put, taste the tequila on as well, which actually adds a bit of bitterness at the back end. <clears throat> and reminds you of all the stupid things you did when you were young. Yeah, I'm older than you. Or is that just, or is that just me? <laughs> <laughs> Drinking tequila shots at you know late at night. Yeah, actually, it's been a while since I've had a bit of a drink of tequila. I, I think I used to get it with my dad, but I don't think I've done it since then. I had some horrible nights drinking tequila. I don't think I want to repeat any of those. Adrian, you're nodding your no. head, so I'm guessing you've had the tequila. Yeah, no, no, I was just listening to what you were saying about um, about about the palate cleanser, if you like. Yeah. Um, I know. I know what I've done um, with this style of beer, and, and certainly um, the Liner Vices is I've, I've used it as a bit of a palate reset in between in between bigger beers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what I mean by that is, you know, I might start off on a IPA or <laughs> sounds funny. Start off on an IPA or, or a or, or a double IPA, and then I'll have something like that like this to, to reset my palate and then I'll have a, um, an Imperial stout. That's good. Go, go hard or go home. It sounds like it, Adrian, like start off with some, yeah. <laughs> start off with some, just ease into it with a double IPA and then Russian yeah, Imperial well, stout. Right. And <laughs> I really love a anything in a barrel that that's me. Um, yet wild sours, wild ferments, um, as well as, 
um, BA Imperial Stouts, yeah. We'll have to make sure you're involved in the uh, when we do a, a f ferment style, and you can. Uh, I know you're pretty keen on that. And you can maybe talk to a few brewers and see if we can get somebody involved because I've been. Well, we won't, we won't get a, a brewer in every time. It'd be good to get them in, you know, yeah. occasionally. So maybe Ross Kenrick from Backus might be good to get in. I was yeah, thinking yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. He does a lot. He's a mad scientist. That like. Yeah, yeah. The mad scientist. Yeah. That might be a good idea. Yeah. Down she goes. Well, oh, it's too late. Nigel's already finished. I was just going to say, should, should we smell? What do we smell? You got your glasses there. Let's swirl them around. Put a little hand over. Try and trap the aromas and um, and give it a little smell. What I guess you probably should be smelling the uh, whatever fruits in there, whatever flavors in there. But then what else? I'm going to, going to go with the lime goes and now, which uh, Nathan's got. So, is that the Akasha one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I'd be interested to see what he how he goes with the goes because he's always hop heavy with his beer, so this is a bit, bit of a departure for him. Well, the the write up calls it a margarita, so okay, so it might be a bit similar to this, this thing. But when, when you talk about tequila and and memories and whatever i picked this because i am quite a fan of margaritas so whenever i see a margarita type or anything described as a margarita in a can i usually tend that way i don't mind it the odd good tequila shot i don't have that many bad memories of it that's probably why i still don't mind it i think a lot of my memories have faded but that they're sort of flat probably more flashbacks than memories i just got served up platter oh nice that's what that looks like in a glass and yeah it is a little bit hazy but um still got that yeah. nice creamy tight foamy head um and on the light lighter color but a little bit hazy well, well the other well, thing um poof. i was mentioning that earlier the other thing i was going to mention about head retention is um i think we might find a lot of more a lot more goes is coming out with good head retention um and so I mentioned earlier, when they do this kettle souring, it's great. It gives you the souring. It gives you quick souring, gives you good character, but it kills the head retention because the lacto eats all the all the um, proteins that give you head retention. Um, there's another yeast. I don't know if you've heard this. another yeast that's come out in the market. Lullamon's brought out this yeast called Philly Sour, and they actually cultivated it from a graveyard. But what they found is an actual yeast that does the souring for you. And brewers are really starting to get on board with this because they can pitch a yeast and it, it sours and ferments at the same time. So all of a sudden they're doing two steps in one. It does take a little bit longer to ferment out than a standard um, ale, if you like. But the thing I've noticed, this is the Philly Sour one. This is the first time I've used it. And I've got much better head retention in these beers than I have doing kettle souring and then using a conventional ale yeast. So I think a lot more breweries are going to be using that new yeast that's come out in the market and you're going to find better head retention because, again, you don't have the lacto eating up all the all the proteins from the wheat. So you said they, so just you the got the, they got the yeast from a graveyard? Yeah, well, that's what they... So, so when yeah. you see these guys, what they do, <laughs> see these guys have got PhD students um, <laughs> and they go, right, off you go. Off you your cotton swabs and go and just rub... It everywhere, and, and then they come back, and so it's almost where, like just, where, particularly from the graveyard, did they get it? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if, if, if it's off someone's tombstone, do their family get royalties or what? I don't, I don't know. Like, I they're, bet they're, they're dying been, to get their hands on it, though. Oh, they would be. Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so it's an interesting thing the way these. So that, but they just go, they just swab everything, and then they come back and just put thing on plates, see what grows, and then isolate what they can, see what they can brew with, and just see what works. It's really just throwing everything up against the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, but that's how they came up with this new yeast, and it's a big deal in craft brewing at the moment because brewers don't have to do this kettle sour thing. They can just throw this yeast in. It does the job for them and to get better head retention. So we'll see. I think a lot of breweries are starting to do that now, which means you'll get more sours and more gozers coming out with better head retention. 
Well, this this one, even though it poured and I said it's gone completely. Yeah, it didn't last. Yeah, it, it went it went pretty quick. I tell you what, it's damn tasty, yeah. isn't it, Nathan? Oh yeah. Bloody <laughs> hell! This is this is like um, yeah, like I mean, if if you poured this over a ice slushy or something, and and served it at you know five o'clock with a little umbrella in it, you'd definitely it'd pass as a as a margarita oh. for sure. Oh, you get away leaving that one in the freezer then. Mm. Put into a slushy and you put hand. Yeah, just pour that over ice, it'd be be perfect. So Nigel. So, yep. Have your beers have they got have they got wheat in them? My beer, this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first the beer. first one did, but I don't think this one does. Yeah, your first one looked like it did, because looking at looking at that head. Yeah. But but interestingly, this is hazy and the other one was clear. So I can, the rebel yeah. I had the rebel I had was both barley and wheat. I don't know. Um, Nathan, do, uh, can you do a quick Google and see if that uh, if the lime zest had any wheat in it? It did, when I read it it was all about the margarita, so it didn't it didn't yeah, really it doesn't, it doesn't really No. Okay. Yeah. But it's damn tasty. Yeah. So in a standard gut, like whatever you, fruit you're flavouring you got, you should smell that. But we should also have light fruity aroma of pome fruit, which is pears, such as esters, light sourness, slightly sharp. Definitely Noticeable sharp. coriander. Now that's the thing, like a standard goes it will have coriander in it as well. And I'm not sure a lot of these craft beer interpretations, they're probably leaving that out sometimes. It depends on how what sticklers they are for that style. Yeah. But I suspect coriander is something that gets chucked out and put back in depending on what they want to achieve. But coriander gives it a spice kick, though. And I mean, the coriander does, can be yeah. quite taste as well. But coriander is like a political party. You either love it or hate it. Yeah, I, I, I've had some beers with it. Yeah. And I mean, some have worked, some haven't um, for me. So, and I mean, even the ones where it's worked, it's... Not something I'd probably go out of my way and buy. No, I'd probably kind of say somewhere like Scratch Bar or I've got it in a, or I've got it in an admin calendar. They've got something I'd go to the shelf. Oh, that's coriander. I'll have a crack at this. A lot of people really hate it, so I think even listing it as an ingredient uh, would would sort of take out a small part of the market. I reckon. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I went to the Scratch Bar once. And it was a done by a home brew mob that was a Brisbane as a co-lamp. Come at uh, beer and it didn't work for me. Uh, and I mean, I'm I'm generally pretty easy to please, but I went, oh, no, this is a bit of a mess for me. Uh, but yeah, some of the more out there beers in the Advent calendars have tried with coriander and they've been a bit hit and miss as well. Yeah. The thing about coriander, like it does give you the coriander flavour, but the other thing coriander brings to the beer, which you might not expect, is this real sort of lemony, a bit of a lemony kick. I can't remember what's in the coriander. Um, I think linalool or it might be the geranial that goes through the fermentation. But whenever you, the coriander seems to give you that lemony quality. And that's why when you get these beers, like you're seeing a lot of gozes with lime in it, well, they give you this, if you put the coriander, you get the lemon and then you put the lime with it and it gives you that nice sort of um, lemon-lime um, flavour. But that's the funny thing about coriander often comes out as more lemony. Sure, it's more than just lemony because there's also that coriander kick to it, but that's part of what it brings to the beer. I really like this, Nathan. That's a good beer, isn't it? This has got a bit of a fizz to it as well, which I'm enjoying. It's got a little bit of zestiness. It's got a bit of tartness with it, and it's, but it's not overpowering. It's actually quite subtle. It's subtle without being weak. I've got to keep having water, otherwise my tongue just... I'm just, like, getting all this bitingness on my tongue that just can't yeah. can't cope with it. I love it, but it it's like salami. I love it eating it, but the next day it kills me. So how do you go with a big lambic then? Um, I'm I'm not huge into 
big sours. I'm not for lack of interest, but probably lack of availability. Yeah. Um, and and I also find that uh, so if it's a if it's a red fruit as opposed to a white fruit that like so like yeah. I mean I'm I'm not a wine drinker, but the acidity in white wine absolutely kills me. But the acidity yeah. in red wine I can cope with. Yeah. So dark yeah. darker things tend to um, not not sort of be so aggressive on my palate anyway. But that's just yeah. like that's a personal sure. thing, and like I've just have to come to yeah. uh, come to terms with you know like everybody I think picks up different things because of that. I'm really um, I'm also really dialed into things like diacetyl. Um, and I can pick up the smallest amount of diacetyl in a beer and uh, people go, they can't taste it. And I'm like, oh, it just tastes like sucking on a butter menthol to me. And other people go, I don't get it at all, but it's just really sensitive on, on that part of the scale. But um, other right. other things like, you know, actually, um, I'm, I'm pretty open to trying most things, but it just, and, and even with this, like I really, really like it, but I couldn't drink a lot of it. Yeah. Funny talking about red wine before, Revel did a, an IPA, but it was based on a red wine. It was based on an Italian red wine, uh, and there was another cup as well. And it was just so off the chart. It was just like drinking a red wine. They were like, you taste the, the tannins from the barrel, and it, it was just, Full on, I thought, oh, look, I tried it, but not something I would go by again. Whereas this, I would. Um, you know, this worked a lot. This has worked a lot better. This is actually, you know, I mean, it's, it's a muggy day here in Ipswich. Um, this is actually going down the tree. Uh, but yeah, it's just funny because, yeah, I, I could actually sort of use a red wine IPA as an example. Uh, it wasn't that I was a but it was just like, it was just like I'm drinking a red wine now. I'm not. I'm lucky. I'm not a wine drinker. No, I didn't mind it. Wouldn't rave over it. Probably wouldn't buy it again. This I would. So yeah. talk about flavour. Talk about flavour. Like I, I think I've mentioned most of this already. I shouldn't have. But here we go. Um, like it's sour, but it's not too sour. It's more of a tartness. We've got this salt there, which is a little bit salty, but not salty. It gives you a bit more body to the beer, and you can kind of tell it's there. You notice it, but it does. You don't drink it and go, "Oh, that's salty." Yeah, the salt's not on the chart on this. No, the bitterness is always low, like any other sour beer. It's always quite low. Hops usually play. Actually, in all the ghosts I've seen, hops pretty well are just background for a couple of IBUs, but only a couple. But I don't know. I say that now. Someone's going to come out with a dry hop gozer next week. I know. <laughs> a triple triple dry hop gozer hazy IPA. That's that's the next thing. New world gozer. New world gozer. Like that's what it's like. The absolute bastardization bastardization of a style where you take a historical beer and then change it and call yep. it new world. Yeah. Coming coming next week, Macus. That's, in some ways, by adding fruit to this, I think I think we have, as I understand it, <clears throat> the whole fruit flavour thing. With Berliner Weiss, it was a thing, adding the fruit liqueurs and things to the beer to sort of balance the acidity. But I'm not aware in history of that ever being done. I think it's just the craft industry and modern craft industry has gone, this would go really well with, <clears throat> and sours are picking off, and it's, it's approachable for a hot climate like Australia. Yeah. It's like I fell in love with this beer in Denver, actually. I was at a conference in Denver <coughs> and I had a blood orange blood orange gozer at a small craft brewery that was there. And I just thought, oh, this is the bee's knees. This is amazing. And from then I've sort of just been brewing it and playing with it. And yeah. So what, what do you put that down to? Uh, why, why is that one say good? Whereas, I mean, you say gozer to some people, they would screw the nose up. And... Yeah. I, yeah, do that. I don't, I don't know. Um, that that one, I don't know. It just had it. Just it was the first one I tried, and it just had all the things of a goza. It was slightly salty, so it had a bit of extra, but it didn't taste so salty. Like I said, it's just slightly briny that just gives you a bit more impression of a fuller body and a low body beer. 
um, it had this orange and it tasted a bit sweeter. It, I'm sure it was a well attenuated, but just had this impression of sweetness that came from that orange flavour in the blood orange. And then the sourness was just that bit of tart, just the right bit of tart to cut through the orange flavour and then a bit of coriander kick in the end. And um, I don't know. I just I just tried that, and I just thought, oh, I love this. This is this is great. You should um, you should try Tumut River. Do a uh, blood orange goza. Um, Tumut oh. River Brewing, which is not that far from here. It's in the sort of yeah. um, snowy mountains region, not far from here. And they do one which is which is really good as well. So uh, if you if you see that, or you you can always go online and check out Tumut River Brewing. That that they sell that. Yeah, right. That's a good one. Yeah, I've got that's all I can think. Sorry, I've got the chairman. Whether um, UMI be at the try yet? The UMI IPA. I'm a big UMI fan. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think the can's better than the than the like it's a it's an average IPA, but it's a pretty cool can. So buy it for the can. Yeah, yeah well. Wow, I got a brand on subscription, so I was pretty excited to see it. Anyway, sorry, I digress. That's all right. Um, and and that's the main thing. Like I think a lot of craft brewers now use it as a base to add blueberry, peach, mango, passion fruit, whatever, just to throw different flavours at it, which is what the market loves at the moment. That's what people and in Australia, hot climate. It just seems to go well. It just is a great sort of base to add all those flavours to and people find it refreshing and tasty. I was going to say, uh, particularly with a beer style like this, um, my wife who doesn't like beer would absolutely smash this. And I think that's a big part of why um, those sours and styles of beer are popular at the moment because what's happened is you go into a a craft brewery or like just let's just in a in a small brewery whether it's hard road or wherever you are and you you know people are going into those places that wouldn't normally go into them i mean 20 years ago 30 years ago like you know blokes went to the pub and the girls went out for dinner or something like that it was like you know and and they didn't want to go into a pub because it wasn't the right environment but i mean we went up just driving up the coast the other day and we stopped in at the new maltman brewery in in Badala. And it's like a, it's a beautiful garden setting and, you know, they do nice food and there's a dog there and, you know, it's just like totally not like a brewery. And, you know, my wife goes in there and, and I order, you know, uh, um, like a, a flight, a, a paddle. The IPA. Yeah, and I no, there was like a, there was a honey, honey saison and there was a raspberry wheat ale in it and she's like, oh, God, they're beautiful. Like she wouldn't touch the IPA because it's just too bitter. But like all these beers and my same with my 22 year old daughter, like hates beer. But if I give her a sour, she's like, oh, that's that's nice because it doesn't taste yeah. like beer. And it's more like that cider sort of, you know, sweet tart flavors, which appeal to a new audience. I'm not going to say it's just female because there's plenty of guys that don't like bitterness in beer as well, but like it these sort of styles of beer which are not traditional styles often appeal to people who don't like traditional style beers and that's why you know like she just walked through a minute ago if i gave her this she'd she'd drink it for sure yeah. and it's it's like um it reminds me of that canadian club ad oh i'm, I'm over beer and, you know i want <laughs> something else the sours are a bit like that you know you think of a, a dry ginger ale with a bit of bit of liquor whatever that is it's that same sort of thing a squeeze of lime a little bit of sourness a little bit of zing a little bit of fizz a sour beer is a sort of heading in that direction as well so yeah it, it it's a different type of beer it's a different type of market um it, rather than that full hot driven beer and that's probably the difference that's well, what i think it's not even that not the, 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 the hot driven beer the you know driven the uh you like it yeah, your dry beers and you know, you know, and your sort of summer lagers. So I mean, it's it's just sort of main the mainstream stuff. And I mean, I, and I mean, it's funny because I mean, I'm going to be over the Canadian Club and dry after about three of them. I 
I just can't do ginger ale. Yeah. Yeah. Just another story. Oh, why not? Um, my neighbour across the road. You know, he's not a he's not really a craft beer guy. He'll drink anything, but he, he'll give everything a go as well. He's quite good like that. And um, of all the beers I make, I've taken him the Goza that I make. It's a lemon lime Goza, and I take it to him and I. Oh, what do you? Oh, yeah, I love. He just raves about it, and then I. So every year now, I say, okay, we'll do a batch. We'll do a batch, and we'll split it. And he gets half the batch, and I keep half the batch. And so that's become our thing now. Of all the beers he has, he, he just raves about the Goza. So I, I guess that's a testimony to where it fits in this new craft market. Right. And that's not a wild fruited thing. That's just mainly like a standard Goza with a little bit of lime in it, really. Um. So the key is we and all need to move up near, near Simon, you know, so we can all go, oh, yeah, I really like. So Adrian and go, oh, I really like that uh, Lambic you brew <laughs> and get half a batch of that. And yeah. I'll be, oh, I really like that Kolsch you brew. I'll have half a batch of that. Yeah. yeah just, like I'm in I'm in uh, North Brisbane, so North Lakes. Oh, okay, yeah, there you are. Well, I'm out Springfield. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, I'm actually five minutes from the... Um, Springfield. Oh, right. There you go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I grew up north side of Brisbane. I grew up around Ashgrove and the Gap. And oh, yeah. Moved out this way. So, North Lakes wasn't even a thing when I... No. Uh, I get to, get to put on the rugby league team every now and then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I referee league. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I have, have a few interesting moments with them. But yeah, no, yeah, so um, actually I was up up that way last week. I actually went, that's why I couldn't make last year. I was actually up Sandgate Way uh, on the water. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I want to go up and check out Brendale, Brendale Brewing and so on. I usually drop in there, say, somewhere like Orland if I had a game at St. Joey's or, um, or, or Banyo. Brendale's making a killing out here. They're just, people love it. It's, and I just see people who aren't necessarily um, big beer fans or big, yeah. you know, big craft beer. They're they're there. They're dropping on their Facebook. Hey, I'm at all. The, I'm at Brendale, and they, we've got uh, another another brewery opening at Brendale soon too. Um, they've got a little food truck venue coming out, and they're going to put it. And this brewery said, right, I'm going to set up here in amongst the food trucks. I'll serve the beer. They serve the food. <laughs> Which I think is going to be a really good business model for them. They can serve anything and they'll sell it. But um, yeah, so it's all happening down at Brenda. Yeah, well, it's been years. Since I used to go up that way quite a fair bit because I lived at um, at the time when I was with my mum and dad. I was at Stafford High. So I had friends, you know, mate, mine lived at Brendale. So it wasn't too far to get from my place. Then yeah. if I'm in Rhymes, it's probably been there with all the lights and operations and they're now. Yeah, we have to be a straight run. Straight run through. Mm. Um, yeah, I moved. <clears throat> I moved right. down the area about ninety-three. We might um, but, uh, start to wrap this up then. I think Simon, is there anything else you wanted to cover off on, or no? Unless any is anything else. Um, in my mind, uh, goes as basically a wheat beer with salt added that gives it a bit more body and it's sour. Not quite as sour as a sour, but it's got a little bit of lactic acid in there to give it some bite. And that coriander, it gives it that lemon kick and a little bit of coriander tilt to it. Um, lots of bubbles. Sometimes good head retention, sometimes not, depending on that kettle souring process. But that's it in a nutshell, I think. Yeah, nice. Thanks for that, Simon. Has anybody got any questions in relation to the style? Or... Oh, yeah, I guess... I a question for me, I suppose, is just curious what differentiates a goza versus a, a sour, and is it the, that saltiness or brininess that comes through, or is it the geographically and, and that's what defines it as, as something different? Because I know I looked at I looked at the shelf as I was picking. My only regret with this, I didn't get more than one. Um, <coughs> the, there was if there was twenty sours on the shelf, there was only three goes. I was just trying to you know work out what differentiates the difference between a sour. <coughs> Yeah, well, well, I might just grab grab hold of that for a sec um, because, like, sour is not a style. 
So uh, sour is 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 actually like a um, a subset or a range of beers rather than a style itself. So you can't really. It's like trying to compare a you know an IPA to a lager. You know, like as we you know, I mean, try, this is part of the process of trying to educate people about styles. Is you know, like when you pick up or see something that's branded a lager, it's actually really an American lager, that's the style we all know, or most of us would know, like there's 40 different styles of lager, including Doppelbox and, you know, Box and, you know, uh, Vienna lagers or a whole range of stuff. So sour is really like a subset of styles. Um, and then it depends which style you're looking at, you know, like um, um, Adrian's keen on, you know, things like lambics and there's farmhouse ales and there's a whole range of you know beers that use uh whether it's um uh like a lactic acid or whatever it is that sort of produces that sourness like the linen wise and things like that but it's pretty hard to just go sour versus uh goza because what are you comparing it to like which, which version of that and unfortunately most of the branded stuff which comes out with sour on it probably doesn't fit into a, a typical style. I don't, I don't even know where, you know, like your hope sours and things like that with a big, I don't even know what style of beer that is really. It, it's a, it's just a statement of pH really. It's yeah, a, that's right. Yeah. This yeah. Is, so this is below four P, pH of four. Yeah. Yeah. I, when, yeah. when we look at the BJCP styles, we've got <clears> European <throat> sour ale. <clears throat> and we've got 23A Berliner Weiss, B Flanders Red Ale, which is a red ale that's thrown in a in a cask and gets sour. <clears throat> Bud Bruin, a brown version of the same thing. Lambic, which we talked about. Goose, which is a premium sort of blended lambic. Fruit lambics. And Goza now. In the 2021, they've added Goza into the guidelines there. So it's part of this European sour thing. But in our modern market, sour basically means probably just, yeah, pH of, of less than four, really. It's going to be, and when I see sour, I think it's less hop-driven beer, and it's going to be the balance with the malt's going to come more from the acidity. But you're right, it's not, not a style, but I guess that's what it communicates to me when I read that on a can or written somewhere. When I see sour, that's what I think. It's not going to be bitter, it's not going to be hot driven, but it will be, the malt will be balanced by the sourness more so than anything else. I know that doesn't, probably, probably doesn't answer the question, Nathan, but you get, get the point about the, you know. I guess what I'm trying to say with, it, with the European, the Goza is a subset of those sours, like sour talks about the acidity of the beer. And then within that goes, it would be a small little <coughs> category within that sour. Um, <coughs> but I don't know what that is, but um, probably most closely aligned to a, a Berliner Weiss. If in the guidelines, when it says comparison, it compares it closely to a Berliner Weiss. <coughs> no idea what that sound is. Does anybody else get that? <coughs> Anyway, that might be a good time to wrap it up. Oh, gone? No. Sounds like a massive mosquito. <coughs> that might be a good time to wrap it up anyway, because we're coming up on an hour anyway. So um thanks everybody for joining in. Thanks, Simon, for your uh uh, wisdom and sharing of information thanks guys for joining in and being part of it um hopefully as time goes on we'll get uh, a few more people join in and like i said we can uh, get some brewers join in we've had one already and i've got a, i've actually got a couple lined up so we've got slow lane are going to come and and join in on uh, what was the style i organized there can you remember <laughs> um did you, did you have like a Belgian quad or something? Yeah, it was there, actually. Was yeah, so that'll be pretty cool because like that. Um, that makes that'll some be awesome nice. beers. We'll, um, we'll be written we'll up for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> only one of those. <laughs> um, and what was the other one I hooked up with too? There was I, I've organised a couple anyway. So we're going to try and organise 
a brewer to join in, you know, at least every second or third time. Um, but it, it's a little bit of work to get them organised. So um, sometimes we'll have a brewer, sometimes we won't. But um, anyway, we're hoping that people join in, get a little bit of information out of it, find it helpful, and uh, we'll, we'll upload them all onto our Vimeo channel at the end of it. So, uh, again, thanks for joining in. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, stay tuned because there'll be more of this. And remember, life's too short to drink bad beer. Hey, Amen. Thanks, guys. Thanks, you, Thanks so much for Cheers, guys. All right, Cheers. See ya. Thank you. <clears throat>